three, two, one. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Diego Altamirano, and I will be talking about timing analysis. Uh, but before that, I would like to completely mega apologize for not being able to be there. Uh, yeah, things happen. Uh, get into the way, and yeah, I was not able to 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 go there. Not even in one week, so I'm really, really, really sad. But anyway, that doesn't mean that I cannot uh, try to share uh, some of my knowledge with you, and uh, hopefully we will be working on a project together. If you decide um, that you are interested in the timing analysis, or you are taking, for obvious reasons, you are taking sorry, uh, one of the timing projects with Tommaso Belloni, who is going to be there next week. We uh, put a new group or teams, I don't know how it's called, channel in the in the Slack. Uh, so please do send a message or to Tommaso or to me uh, and try to get into that group. Um, so we will start discussing uh, um, the techniques. And of course, if you have questions, uh, post them there and we'll uh, see who's uh, faster to answer um, your questions. Um, so, should we start? Very good. Where is it? Here. So, in astronomy, a light curve is a graph of light intensity. So, the, this is the y axis versus time. Uh, and this is the intensity of uh, an object or a particular region in the sky. So, basically, everything that we capture in a region that we choose. Now, the question is, in the, when we plot a light curve, what is it that we actually put generally on the y-axis? What is this 400 or 500 counts? Uh, Theo, sorry, I might have said. Uh, Theo, Matteo, can you uh, report a post and can you have a brief discussion about this? Very good. So I hope that you already got it. It's counts per second. Now, this is something weird that we use counts per second. Um, what we mean is actually photons per second that we detect. And here, what it means is that in each beam that I'm using here, so each of these points has in average 500, let's say, let's put this one, 500 counts per second in that beam. Now, this is a, a, there are a few things that are important here and that we need to take into account. First of all, is what binning is, what is to bin data. And being in, a, having been in, in other workshops, I know that some of you, it's something obvious. For some, some of you, it's something obvious, but for some might not. So binning is basically uh, trying to play like doing a histogram of all the things that you detect. So in a, in, in a CCD, which most of you might know, uh, or in two dimension, when you say that there is no binning, it's because you are using all the data that is in one of these squares. And then when you say uh, two, by, 2 by 2, it's basically all the photons that were detected here, and so on, 3 by 3. But this is in a CCD. When you do a light curve or something else, you need to figure out what is it that you are beaming into. Or uh, if you think about it as a histogram, what type of histogram you're doing and what is it that you are grouping together? Because that will make a lot of difference. So if I come back to this, it's important to know that when I say counts per second, it doesn't mean that each of these points is one second in duration. It could be larger than one second, it can be shorter than one second, but the units are the number of photons per second normalized by the uh, by the time interval that we're using. And this is standard, so my suggestion is do not plot uh, counts per beam, for example, because the counts per beam uh, will change depending on the size of your beam. Um, so the shape that you see will uh, change slightly depending on um, the, the bin size that you use. So talking about binning, 
in the um, 10, 15 minutes, we are going to be talking about power spectra. And you will see that if you do not bin, or if you bin, you will be able to see different things. And let me uh, just explain you what you are seeing here. The two plots are the same thing on the X axis and plotting frequency on the Y axis and plotting something that is called power. So let's say something the same or a proxy of amplitude of a signal. And in the upper part, you are seeing the uh, power spectra and beam. So I'm not beaming in frequency. And the things that you can see is that, yeah, there might be some peak here, maybe here, and that's basically it. However, when you apply proper beaming, then you can see a very nice shape with what we call a quasi periodic oscillation here and the harmonic here. So using proper beaming can um, show you something that before you were not seeing or can actually hide something that you were looking for and you, you will not find it if you are using the wrong beam. So um, moving forward, what we're going to be using here is mainly time series and time series analysis. And this is a, a area of research uh, in many things because basically time series appears everywhere. Uh, this is a, an example that I'm showing you here. Probably at certain point in your life, you were doing time series analysis by eye. Uh, as an example is you were checking the price of, of a telephone and you were seeing how the price was going up or going down, and you were trying to make your own prediction on what was going to be the price in a month or two months to know whether you would buy it or not. It could be a telephone or anything. So you have been already doing some time of time, uh, um, some type of time series analysis. The question is, uh, what techniques can we use to actually quantify things a bit better? Just uh, as, a, as a completeness, if you go to Wikipedia, term series analysis, which is what we're going to do, uh, is defined as the methods for analyzing time series data in order to extract meaningful statistics and other characteristics of the data. Um, it, sells, it says it all. So what is a time series? Well, here it doesn't have to be photons per second. It's just a sequence of data points uh, measured typically one after the other one in time. Uh, and if you are lucky, uniform time intervals in uniform time intervals. The more uniform, the better. Uh, but you can have time series, for example, of the position of um, uh, a person uh, in Google Maps. And you wouldn't know every second, but you will know it first half an hour, then two hours, then every 10 minutes, etc., etc. That's a time series uh, with coordinates, uh, but it doesn't have a uniform time interval. So if you were to analyze that, you need to use different techniques than the ones that we use when you have what I would say beautiful data that is uniform time intervals. So there is a lot of there, and we will not discuss all the techniques that there are. Um, the idea here is that you understand that they, some of these techniques, not even all, exist, and why you should care and why you should always think about potentially do some uh, time series analysis in your results, even if you are studying uh, objects that you think are not changing much in time. Um, so let's put an example of this. This, this is the, the Mexican peso versus the US dollar. Um, and you see that it's in the 2000 or something like that, there was a price and then it went up. Um, this tells us a lot about the economy. Something happens here in 2008. And I will leave it to you uh, to find out what it is. Uh, you can do the same with other uh, exchanges. So for example, the um, pound to the US dollar or the euro 
or it doesn't matter where you're coming from, the local money to the US dollar. And you can see some of these shapes, apologies. So for example, if you were to see a dip, another dip, a peak, and you can try to understand what is the relationship between those extremes, the peak and the valley, and something that was happening uh, in society or in the markets or internationally. And this will then allow you to and make some predictions about what will happen the next time. So I focus now on the economy. Imagine that you have a time series and you have something that looks like a sinusoid. Here I'm plotting time. This is the how well the economy is. And let's say that it, 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 it shows like a sinusoid and if you look at the, the definition, basically you say when the economy is expand, it's going up, it's called expansion. You reach the peak that is boom, then always at certain point we start going down and that's the recession. And then when you reach this part is the depression part and you hopefully it goes again into expansion and so on. Uh, so you could think of uh, the market emotion cycle. So what is that the people feel when you're going in one or another part of this sinusoid? So if you're, for example, in the expansion, uh, people will feel uh, optimism at a certain point, excitement, thrill. When you are here, some euphoria, and then you see that things are not going that well. So uh, your emotions are then turning negative, so anxiety, denial, fear, panic, you know. How can it be that everything goes to trash? Um, and then uh, suddenly, for whatever reason, things start going up, and then that depression, depression becomes hope. You start feeling better, and you arrive to optimism again, and the cycle continues. Why would you say that I'm showing, or why do you think I'm, I'm, I'm showing this? Well, because there are different parts on this cycle that uh, obviously here are not the same. So even if you wanted to do an average, so you say, OK, I'm going to make an average of this data set. The average would be something between optimism uh, and desperation or fear or panic. And I don't think that that's a good description of, the, of this data. And I hope that, that you agree. Besides, uh, it is obvious to you that a pure fear is not the same of excitement. So and definitely euphoria when you're at top is not the same as depression. So, What I'm trying to say here in terms of time series is that if you have something varying, and particularly if it's periodic or quasi-periodic, you can you need to think about the selection of data that you use and what that selection means. There's going to be, as I will show you uh, later, moments where you cannot really tell what is one from the other one, and then you make an average. And you are going to make an average of a full cycle that has all these emotions. If you're going to do that, you have to be careful how you interpret that data. Uh, here in the example that I gave you in the, in the emotional cycle, it's obvious that you cannot compare euphoria and uh, being depressed. So think that in the future, when you do your kind of analysis for whatever uh, object you chose to do, you have to also you know, use the same logic and be very careful when you make averages. Particularly if you know or you detect that there are some variability in there. So here, uh, it comes uh, to a point where we, we should discuss, I think, good time intervals or GTIs. I will put a pause right now.
and I would like to, you to discuss what you think good times intervals are. So good time intervals are very simple. It's what do they say? It's it's intervals uh, where for you you say that that time is or that interval is good for you, and generally it has the form of two columns, uh, and generally it's seconds uh, from a certain moment. I think that I, here I use seconds from the beginning of. RX mission or something like that, or maybe I invented it. I don't remember. Um, but basically, it creates um, uh, an interval, and you have to use whatever uh, the mission is using for the GTIs. So th this is very important. When you create GTIs, most of the cases is not GTIs from the beginning of that observation. So you don't start in zero, but you start on a, a long number that is the seconds that are defined as defined for, for that mission. But what is important is that um, if you make the, the offset uh, to this, then you see that, for example, the first line, it's just uh, 80 seconds, and the second line, it's 2,700 and something uh, seconds of data, and so on. But this is useful for you to know how long these things last, but this is generally the right format. Now, as far as I know, there is no standard tool that you can use for every problem. And um, what is good time for you, it might be bad time for someone else. So if you, for example, you are analyzing spikes in the light curve, it can be that uh, the, the spikes is what you're interested in, and the good times intervals are the ones that are going to extract only the spikes and nothing else. But other people might say, no, the spikes are not where I want to study, I want to study the rest. So your good time interval will be actually the inverse and will take out or take away um, those spikes from the light curves. So let's go back to the expansion boom, recession, depression time. Um, if this was your data set and if these were the type of error bars in your data, you would probably all say, yeah, it is clear that the, the economy is going up. We're going maybe in green um, somewhere here. So then this is a boom. We're all good. The problem is when your data set is, looks like this, where now the thread is the error bars, are the error bars, sorry. So you cannot see uh, the oscillation, at least not by eye, and you can, but you want to still try to understand whether you are on uh, expansion uh, phase or a boom phase or a recession or in a depression uh, phase. So how do you do that? This is a bit of what we're going to be doing today. So let me first start um, with this slide, which for some reason doesn't look that good today, uh, but there is missing some axis here, apologies, but basically it's time uh, versus count rate. And <coughs> you would agree that in this um, uh, top left, if you are seeing the same way as I see it, uh, light curve, at the beginning there is not much variability and then you start seeing this type of oscillations that look like they are happening more or less uh, at a given period. In the bottom left, you see actually uh, also a very nice light curve with um, a lot of uh, very periodic uh, kind of uh, flares. And most of you would say that uh, on the right, both bottom and up, uh, the light curve is quite uh, stable and there is no variability. So, uh, this is bad. I promise to do it again, uh, but trust me when I tell you that actually this one has a very nice QPO at a few hertz that you cannot see by eye, 
so sorry, a very nice quasi periodic oscillation um, that you cannot see by eye. While indeed this one doesn't have anything, and there is a missing um, power spectra. Which apologies, I can actually see it on the right of my screen, but it's not appearing there. So so far, the point was okay. Uh, why are we talking about this? Why not just stop in doing power spectra or analyzing my data? Well, the first thing that you need to remember, or one of the main messages that I want you to remember from this part of this of the talk is always make a light curve first. Before you go to doing energy spectra, before you try to do any time variability analysis, anything, you first do a light curve. And if necessary, in different energy bands or using different binning factors. Let me give you an example. Time binning, how do things change? So this is a light curve um, of a source. I think this is a GRS 1915. And as you will see here on the top is the time being that I'm using. So each, uh, while I'm plotting about, yeah, 500 seconds on the x-axis, the time beam is 0.01 seconds. I think that we will all agree that there is nothing that you can see there. However, let's try to change the beam. 0.2, and it's always in factor of two. There is a point, probably at two seconds, where you maximize what you are able to see. And then, at a certain point, if you be continue beaming, you actually stop uh, making it better, but you start making it worse. So the less you been, the worse it is. The more you been, the worse it is. You have to find that equilibrium in your data set, and you don't know it in advance. So there is a lot of playing, uh, and it, there is not a single recipe that actually um, can explain it all. Or can don't think that uh, we uh, more experienced persons we will do the light curve like that and uh, use the right thing. We have to explore the data, and that's something that you should be doing. OK, and what about the energy lesson selection? Does your light curve change? Well, remember that you have uh, an observation where the average energy spectra looks like this, and plotting energy in the X-ray axis and flux in the Y axis. And this is just the ratio between the model and the, and the data. And these are the different components of your spectra. These are different physical components. So imagine, for example, that this is the one that is varying, the one that I'm trying to paint here. So the, if this is the component that produces the variability, and you actually choose to observe this side, you're probably not going to see any variation. If instead you'd make an observe um, a light curve only between, for example, 1 and 10 kV, you will see a lot of variation as opposed of when you would do a light curve between 10 and 100 kV. So choosing the right energy band, it's also very, very important. So the same idea, I chose a time beating, I don't remember which one. And now what I'm going to do is show you how the light curve looks in different energy channels. And so again, this is an old animation I made for RxD. What is important is that one to three, it's about two kV. And then as, as you go higher in channels, it goes from two kV to uh, 60 kV. Let's see. Already at channel 51, everything disappeared and everything is maximized between channels 7 and 43 or something like that, 7 and 13. So the same observation of the same source, different energy channels show me something different. So yeah, this is a, a new thing because now you have to take into account the time beam and the energy 
range that you use to try to understand what is in uh, there. So let's go back and try to summarize a bit everything. I'm asking you before you start analyzing all the data that you do a live plot, that you get an idea of what the like the source looks like in time. And to do that, you actually I recommend you that at least you pick up two or three energy bands in using the instrument that you have. So as for example, if you were using nicer data, make a light of between 0.3 and 10, make a light of between 0.3 and 2, and then another one between 2 and 10. How do those light curves change for a given beam? Some of you will skip that step. You are going to go directly into energy spectra. Trust me, sometimes it works, sometimes it's a waste of time. Very good. So, example. Um, if you're, uh, this is optical data of, uh, of some dipping, um, of dipping of serving a, in a source. So if you were to have this light where the continuum is here and these are the dips, and this is basically, this is the zoom to here. So these are the dips that I was talking about, and this is the zoom of this. So this is how your light curve looks if you do a zoom in it. Then you will realize a few things. First of all, that there are some variations there that look a bit quasi periodic. And second is that if there is a change in intensity, then you cannot actually make an average of that observation and try to study the average energy spectra of all that. Because basically you are going to be making the average energy spectra of these valleys plus this, plus the center, plus the other center. So in other words, if we come back to example of, a, of economy, you're making an average spectrum that will explain both depression, boom, expansion, euphoria, all at the same time. And that is, as you can imagine, something different, but you should not go in that direction. Let me give you a, a real example where uh, people have done this, uh, sorry, have done it in the correct way, although correct is a bit subjective. This is a light curve again of a GRS 1915, and there is a lot of variability that you can see by eye, and they also decided to uh, divide this in three, red, black, and green, just saying, well, the bottom is the same as the middle and as the same, and the red is all the same. Now, you might face, find yourself in a, in a problem like this because you say, OK, um, I don't have enough statistics, I don't have enough photons, so I have to divide uh, my data set. But uh, yeah, this is as much as I can do. Let me actually, let me go a step backwards. In an ideal case, if you have a data set like this, you would like to have an energy spectra for each of these points that I plot there. And then you fit the energy spectra of each of these points, and then you see the evolution of your physical parameters, for example, the temperature of the disk. The reality is that you will not have enough statistics, so what you do is you make averages, and that's why uh, the person that wrote this paper did that. Uh, while it's uh, an okay decision, what you need to remember is that you are averaging different um, regions that of different type of data that might not be represented by the same data, uh, sorry, by the same spectrum. So the average spectrum that you measure here in red might not be meaningful. It will give you something, but it might not be meaningful. For this reason, there is another thing that you can actually do uh, before you actually even start selecting between green, black, and red. And <coughs> this brings me to the concept of X-ray colors. It's something that helps you tracing variability in long term scales. So again, um, as an example, this is an energy spectrum, this is flux, this is energy, and you have clearly two different states. 
the red is what is known as the uh, soft state because the soft component uh, dominates and this is called the hard state because the hard uh, part of the spectrum dominates. So what you can naturally do without needing to assume a model is to take your spectrum, divide it in four or in three, you call it A, B, C, and D, and then what you do is create what is called the colors. So you say, well, okay, color one, I will define it as the ratio between all the photons or the number of photons that are detected in B divided by those the I, and color D, color two is D over C. So again, all the photons that you detect in one band divided by the other one. And of course, the intensity, which is what you plot uh, when you do the light curve, is A plus B plus C plus D. So you are not using, you are using independent data there. So let me show you this example where, of why it's important. So you take, uh, this is the light curve of an eclipse in class, uh, sorry, this is deep in source. So this is what we generally define as the continuum. And these parts is where something gets into the way, uh, in the way, and it's highly absorbed. So you, you don't see a lot of variability here. It's a bit difficult uh, to say what is going on. But if what you plot is hardness, hardness is basically um, a color. So for example, if we come back to this, it's as a definition, maybe A over D or B over A, one of those. Then you see that actually, as a function of time, there is a lot of variation. There is something very weird happening in these parts. So you can actually, instead of trying to make decisions on uh, selecting data from the light curve, you can actually say, well, I will make better decisions on the hardness because the hardness allows me to tell, okay, all this seems to have more or less the same spectrum. Uh, and because of that, then actually you would cut more or less like this. And you say, well, this all have the same uh, hardness, probably the same spectral shape, so why not? Uh, adding all that and make a single energy spectra to study the dips. But you can do that and you can do actually even better. You plot cam rate versus that harness. So it's usually called the harness intensity diagram. And what you see is actually all this complexity that you were seeing here and all this complexity that you were seeing here can be summarized as a simple shape like this. So now you can actually say, okay, I'm going to select data from here and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to average all this together. For example, I'm going to divide this in two parts. I'm going to study the peak by itself and again, another one here and here. So now you're moving, you're selecting in the HIV or in the color code diagram and not just some information on the intensity and the hardness, which tells you a bit about the, the shape. You are doing the shape of the spectrum. You are doing it here, making it uh, far better uh, or probably more accurate selection. Um, so does that work? Yeah, it works in general. Um, and then, um, hmm. It works and we're going to stop here for now. Um, so hopefully uh, I'm able to connect anyway and we can have questions. Uh, but as a, as a summary of this part of the lecture, I would say whenever you study a source, even if you're not going to do any timing project, create a light graph, see how uh, constant it is in time or how variable it is in time. If you have sources where you see a lot of variation like in here, then you, you cannot make uh, an average energy spectra or an average power spectra. This is not going to make sense. So you need to find ways to um, basically uh, do selections in this data that 
make sense in terms of um, you are averaging the same thing. You are saying, OK, I'm selecting points which have the same uh, that are described or can be described by the same uh, model and therefore comes from the same or very similar physical process. And as just an example, uh, one of the best ways is doing selections in count rate uh, and intensity simultaneously, so in the HIV simultaneously, and then transform it into here. Now, it is worth saying one thing that um, you will read in many papers that people do this selection in HIVs. You are at the end always doing selection in time. You're always saying the photons between time A and time B and C and D are from the same uh, physical process or at the same configuration of the system and you average them together. But it's always time. So when actually I'm doing a selection in the HIV, the only thing I'm saying is this point here, which I can I know what is the time of that point, then I transform into time and I will do the selection from the event file from there. So um, many, uh, at least in the past, I had experienced that many people thought that you were actually making somehow a selection or the computer was able to do a selection in intensity. You're not doing a selection in intensity. You're using intensity as a proxy for time, and then you, you are all producing some kind of GTIs coming back that you apply to your event file. Um, yeah, to um, uh, do the selections. So we will stop here. We're going to be talking um, more about some techniques, uh, more generic techniques of dealing with your data uh, on Friday. OK, again, super apologies that I first I couldn't be giving even this talk online uh, and second that I wasn't able to be there, uh, but chat to you later.